Thank you, Abby and, and Rhett. Uh, Abby did not know this, but uh, that is one of my favorite songs. Um, and I think it's become more favorite uh, of my, more of a favorite of mine in the last few weeks. I, I've sang that song with uh, 10 to 12,000 other people in uh, one location. But in this moment, I, you know, uh, not, it's not that it's all about feelings, but this moment was more special than uh, singing it with uh, uh, an arena full of people singing it. Um, we need that. We need that reminder, that gospel reminder, that life may fall down around us, life may be crazy around us, it may be uncertain, but Jesus and his sustaining grace will hold us fast. Um, well, if you have your Bibles, I hope you have those there at, at, at your house or wherever you're watching this. Um, go ahead and turn to uh, Luke, and we're going to be in the chapter uh, chapter 19. Uh, we're going to look at verses 41 through 44 in just a few moments. I'm going to be reading uh, and preaching from the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB. But follow along with whatever uh, copy that you have of God's Word. But Luke uh, 19, and go ahead and turn there and... As you do, uh, obviously we've already talked about that today is uh, Palm Sunday, the first day of what we call Holy Week. And, and Holy Week is, is the last week uh, of Jesus' earthly life and ministry. And normally, if, if it were a normal Sunday, whatever that means anymore, that it's accompanied by festive music and, and kids running down the aisle waving palm branches. And, and we love to celebrate Palm Sunday. And I think the reason is because because we know that Easter is so close. It's just around the corner. And But to understand Palm Sunday and what it's really all about that, uh, that we're getting or that the Bible is showing to us, and especially to understand our text that deals with Palm Sunday this morning, then we need to understand a little about what was happening for the centuries well before leading up to the moment that Jesus looked out over the city of Jerusalem before he enters it for the last time. Now to understand that event, we have to remember, if you go back into the Old Testament, that uh, the Jewish people, their land, they as a people, had been occupied by other countries for 700 years at this point. They were taken over by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians, and then by the Medes and the Persians, and then the Greeks. And, and at this point in first century Palestine, they've been taken over uh, uh, by uh, Roman uh, or, or Rome. And so they were consistently looking forward to God's anointed Savior, the Messiah, the Deliverer of Israel that God spoke about uh, through his prophets. And so here is Jesus this, uh, uh, in the first century Palestine, a carpenter's son from Nazareth of all places. And he's claiming that he's not just a carpenter's son, but he's claiming that he is God's actual son. And not only is he claiming that, but he's ministering in and around Jerusalem and Galilee and Capernaum and all of that area. And as he is claiming that he is God's son, he's also claiming uh, as one who actually has authority. And you remember that word? That's, that was the word shmika, that he literally has the word or the, the authority of God resting on him and how he teaches. But not only is he claiming to be God, and not only is he speaking like God, he's also performing miracles that only God could do. I mean, Jesus is casting out demons. He, he's making the blind to see. He, he even raised a dead man to life. His followers at this point are convinced Jesus is the Messiah. They're so convinced that they throw a huge party for him. They, they have a coronation ceremony. That's what we call Palm Sunday. That's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all show. And so they get this donkey and her colt, and they, and which fulfills uh, the prophecy of Zechariah 9, 9, and, and they set Jesus on it. They spread their cloaks on the road, cloaks on the colt. Uh, they, they cut palm branches. They just roll out the red carpet for Jesus. And then Luke shows us a very odd look at this joyous occasion. Look with me in verse 41. And as he, that's Jesus, approached and saw the city, he wept over it. He wept for it. As he approached and saw the city, he wept for it. Does this surprise you? That, that when Jesus' followers are rejoicing and, and what should be a joyous occasion, Jesus is weeping 
There's only two times in the Bible that we see Jesus weeping. The first one is uh, John 11, 35, everyone's favorite uh, Bible verse to memorize, Jesus wept, where Jesus is weeping at uh, Lazarus' tomb. But that word is that Jesus was quietly shedding tears. That's not the word that's used here. Jesus, the word that's used here is Jesus is wailing. He is lamenting over Jerusalem. Now imagine the scene and how odd this is. A, a huge crowd of disciples are throwing Jesus a huge parade with Jesus as the grand marshal. And here's Jesus in the middle of it all, wailing over Jerusalem like an Old Testament prophet. Seems out of place, doesn't it? In fact, there's a lot about Palm Sunday that seems out of place. See, normally Jesus discouraged people from making him Messiah, calling him Messiah, but now we see that he's encouraging them to do so. Normally when someone is declared a king, there's joy had by all, but here Jesus is wailing in the midst of the disciples rejoicing. See, the context of Palm Sunday is one where the Jewish people wanted nothing more than to be free from Roman occupation, and they missed the opportunity that God had handed to them that day. Now, we're not being occupied by a foreign country, but our world has been invaded by COVID-19, and it has virtually brought our world to a standstill. And we want nothing more than this thing to go away and us to be free again, to go outside, to do what we were doing, uh, to go to the stores, to, to have uh, our jobs back and all of those things. We want nothing more but God to rescue us from that. And as gas prices go down, society's anxiety is just continuing to go up. And we all ask at some point, where's Jesus in all of this? Well, he's the same place he's always been. He's in the midst of our suffering. He's right in the middle of our anxiety and what we are fearing and what we are frustrated with. We are in the midst of suffering and uncertainty right now. And so we don't want to miss what God is doing. We don't, we don't want to miss what Jesus is saying to us. So in the midst of a national and global crisis of suffering, Jesus is in our midst offering us peace. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the day and what you're about to show us in your word. God, we thank you for a day like Palm Sunday. And we thank you for a day uh, that we get to gather around your word, albeit uh, virtually. God, but we thank you also, most of all, for the Lord Jesus who entered into our suffering with us. God, and that you have brought peace to us. And so we thank you for that, Lord. And we pray that you would magnify the words and the works of Christ in our midst this morning. And that we would see what you were doing and that we would hear what you were saying. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So that's the context of Palm Sunday that we're dealing with this morning. And, but yet, that we want to know why is it, because that's a big deal, uh, that Jesus would weep when everything else around him seems to say this is a day of rejoicing. And so why is it that Jesus wept? Because it's going to, whatever the answers are, are also going to motivate us as believers to join Jesus. And does our hearts, are our hearts moved in the same way that Jesus is in the midst of the suffering and the anxiety that we see around us? And so that's what the question we're going to answer this morning in three truths here, or three answers. Why does Jesus weep? Why does he weep over Jerusalem? Well, I want you to look in verse 42 because that's where we find our first answer. Uh, the first reason that Jesus wept over Jerusalem was because of their unbelief. Jesus wept over their unbelief. Verse 42 says, If you knew this day what would bring peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. If you knew this day what would bring peace, but it is now hidden from your eyes. So Jesus said that if they had only known the opportunity that they had that day for peace, they would have had it. But since they did not know what that day was, they did not see that opportunity, they did not seize that opportunity, now what they had... Well, God has hidden that from them now. They missed what God was doing in their midst. They missed what God was saying to them. So what is exactly hidden from them? What did God hide from them? Well, he says that he has hidden the things that lead to peace, that bring peace, that lead to peace from them. So the peace here that Jesus is talking about is not the absence of conflict. It's the peace that is the result of spiritual salvation. 
I mean, they missed what God was doing in their midst because their peace was not the peace that Jesus was offering. Their peace was freedom from Rome. Jesus' peace is freedom from sin. Their peace was freedom from a physical problem. But Jesus' peace is, uh, is, is freedom from your greatest spiritual problem. Jesus wanted them to be free, but they missed what he was doing and he, they missed what he was saying. So what is Jesus saying about what are the things that lead to peace? Well, being good enough won't lead you to this kind of peace. Being smart enough won't lead you to this kind of peace. Uh, being able to keep your job uh, through the pandemic or finding another one real soon won't bring you to this kind of peace. Being lucky enough not to be exposed to the virus or family members to be exposed to the virus will not lead to this kind of peace. Even finding a vaccine will not lead to this kind of peace that Jesus is talking about. There are only two things in the Bible that lead to this kind of peace. The blood of Jesus and your trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Colossians 1.20 says that Jesus has reconciled all things to himself by making peace by, blood, by his blood shed on the cross. So the blood of Jesus has given us a peace opportunity. We have been invited into the peace of God, the peace that passes all understanding, the peace that results from knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Jesus has done that by the way of the cross. But there's a second component is our trust in uh, him for our salvation, our trust in him for that kind of peace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That's what we call that. So Jesus did his part by dying on the cross, shedding his blood, opening the way for peace for us. Have you done your part? Putting your faith and your trust in the finished work of Jesus. So Jesus wept over their unbelief. Does he still weep over your unbelief? Believer, are you weeping with Jesus? Does that, does that move our hearts to weep over our neighbors and our family members that are even in our own homes right now, maybe even listening to this this morning? Do we weep over their unbelief of just not knowing Christ yet? We should because Jesus' heart was moved that way. So that he wept over their unbelief. But there's a second reason that he wept as well. Jesus wept over their coming judgment. Jesus wept over their coming judgment. Look with me in verse 43 and 44. He says, For the days will come on you when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground. They will not leave one stone on another in your midst, because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. You see, in the previous verse, Jesus said that they had missed this day, the present day that Jesus had come into their midst. Now he says that there are days that are coming, future tense, that will be full of judgment instead of full of blessing. Jerusalem, which the name literally means the city of peace, now becomes the focus of God's judgment because they missed what God was doing and they did not hear what he was saying. See, the enemies that Jesus refers to here in, in 43... In 44, that, that is Rome. And we know that historically because in AD 70, Emperor Vespasian uh, dispatched Titus to Rome or to uh, uh, Jerusalem with 5,000 troops to deal with the Judean rebellion. And, and the result of that uh, nine month or so siege was that Jerusalem was completely destroyed, it was wiped off the face of the map, so to speak. And we even have an account of that. Listen to how Josephus, the uh, early Jewish historian, writes about this event. He says, Caesar had already commanded the entire city and the temple to be razed to the ground. That means to be leveled completely to the ground, leaving only the towers which projected higher than the others to stand. All of the rest of the wall which encompassed the city, the demolitions teams leveled so that no one who would come there in the future would ever believe that that spot had been inhabited. And it wasn't just the structure and the temple and the wall that Jesus foresaw being destroyed. It was everything, even the people within Jerusalem. Jesus prophesied that the Roman army would crush the people within Jerusalem, that there would be total and complete destruction of Jerusalem 
and its inhabitants. Again, uh, Josephus has, uh, tells us about this in his writings. During that siege on Jerusalem, he says that people were starved to death during it. That at one point, 500 people a day were crucified. And word had even got out that, that people were beginning to defect to the Roman army, giving up, and they were allowing that until they found out that people were swallowing gold coins and, 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 and smuggling that out of Jerusalem. So you know what they did? Everybody after that, they literally gutted open just to get the coins out of their bodies. Josephus said at the end of all this, and because it was during Passover when the siege began, that 1.1 million people were destroyed uh, in, in this whole siege of Rome on Jerusalem. And as bad as that sounds, the Bible speaks of a day of judgment that is far more catastrophic and far more costly than this. The Bible calls that day the, the great day of the Lord, the, the day of the Lord, the, the, the judgment day, when we're all going to stand before God and give an account and accepting Jesus leads to great blessing, but rejecting Jesus leads to great pain. And the, the beauty of this is the gospel, is that Jesus bore our pain on the cross. That's why he went to the cross. That's why the crowd did not dissuade him. That's why the rejoicing may have been great, but Jesus saw something greater in that, because he was not going to sidestep suffering. He was going to go through the suffering all the way to the cross, because he knew that at the cross he was going to be lifted up, and that the full weight of God's wrath, for you and for me, our sin was going to be placed on him. And he would take every ounce of God's wrath and then he would turn the cup over and then he would say, it is finished. Jesus did, he, he bore that pain for you and me so you wouldn't have to. In fact, Jesus wept over the coming judgment because Jesus values the souls of you and me. He values the souls of people do we value the souls of those around us? Do we weep over their coming judgment if they do not, uh, if they continue to reject the gospel? Does that cause us to want to go even more, to plead even more with them? The case of Christ. Do we weep for them? Don't miss what God is doing in the midst of our suffering, and don't miss what He's saying to us. So Jesus wept over their unbelief, he wept over their coming judgment, but he also, in the last part, we see that he wept over their spiritual blindness, that Jesus wept over their spiritual blindness. It's in the very last part of verse 44, that last phrase, Jesus says, all of this is happening because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. Now, I find that very strange, okay, because you would think that when God visits someone, the creator of the universe, the one who spoke the world into existence, the one who literally raises the dead, you would think that when God is visiting you, you'd recognize it, right? I mean, Abraham did. I mean, he, God came to Abraham before destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham recognized God. When, when God visited Jacob and wrestled with him, Jacob recognized God. When God visited Gideon, Gideon recognized him. And there are more and more times where people were visited by God and they recognized him. They knew it. So why did Jerusalem miss this? Why is it that they did not recognize the greatest day of their life with the greatest person that could have been in their life standing in their midst? Well, Jesus continually points to the fact that they were spiritually blind. I mean, think about it. Jesus had already performed great miracles like feeding 5,000 people with a, a Lunchable, right? I mean... He did that. He, uh, he walked on water. I haven't seen anybody do that since then. Um, he exercised authority over demons. He taught people as one having the authority of God. He even raised Lazarus back to, to life, and Lazarus had been dead four days. How crazy would that be if somebody comes uh, to a, a funeral visitation that had been lasted four days longer than the person's uh, deceased, and this guy you know, says something, and the, the corpse gets up and walks out? That would be crazy. Jesus did all of that. And yet, some people recognized who he was, but most did not because they were spiritually blind. You know, spiritual blindness is, is a lot like staying overnight uh, in an unfamiliar place. Um, I, I, had, I got the opportunity to, to preach at a, a place um, up in uh, northern Mississippi back in September and I was staying in this house, and, and it was an unfamiliar place. First night, I was 
tired from driving, and I get there, and, and I don't really scope everything out, and so I just cut the lights off, go to bed, and of course, you got to get up in the middle of the night, right? you got to get water or whatever. How do you think that went? I don't even know where the light switch is in this place. And I'm fumbling through the, 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 the room, and I'm knocking over stuff. Some old lady stuff just went crashing onto the ground. And I make a mess of the room. I make a mess of myself and everything around me. That's a lot like spiritual blindness. So in a dark room, in suffering and anxiety, what do we need most? We need a light. And guess what? The good news is Jesus calls himself the light of the world. And he has a special ministry to the spiritually blind because in the same book of Luke, in Luke's gospel, if you go to the beginning of Luke's gospel, this is what he says at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. In the midst of a national and global crisis, do you see what God is doing? Do you hear what God is saying? Jesus wants to give us sight, but Jesus wants to give your neighbor, your family member, your coworker, your employer, your employee sight. Jesus wants to give the stranger standing six feet behind you in the line at Walmart sight. Jesus wants to give us sight. Do we weep over these people that haven't yet seen the goodness and grace of Jesus yet? Well, we're in a time in history that none of us have ever been before. And, and you'll get that later, but in more ways than one, right? Um, so as family members, we are concerned about the health and exposures uh, of our loved ones. Uh, 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 but we're also trying to figure out how to do life together when our lives have been turned upside down and inside out. As healthcare professionals, you may be suffering with worry about contracting the virus and then spreading it to your family. As an employee, you may be suffering from anxiety of not knowing if you'll get another job soon or if you'll be able to keep your job. As an employer, you may be suffering from the uncertainty of providing for your own employees and your business. And even as a pastor, sometimes I'm overcome with grief because I can't physically be with you and I can't personally minister to you. So we have to find other ways like email or the phone. We're all in this together, but if we're going to get through this together, then we've got to see what God is doing and listen to what God is saying. Millions of Christians, guys, millions of Christians have been praying fervently for years for revival and hopefully, we are on the brink of seeing a movement of God unlike any that we have ever seen before. A movement of God that can only be attributed to the work of the Holy Spirit as He moves the church to faith and, and repentance and holy living. As He, as he moves uh, uh, people to convict them of sin. As He comforts us in our sorrows and encourages us in our boldness in the gospel. I'm hearing more and more stories of many of you being able to have more gospel conversations because people are open to that right now. And I'm reading more and more stories about Christians around the world having many opportunities to share their faith, unlike any other time that they've had. In fact, one particular story came in the form of an email, and for reasons of uh, safety, I will keep the names and locations anonymous, but this is from a Christian organization in a closed country with predominantly Muslim people. The, the, the email, part of the email says, Dear brothers and sisters, one thing has become clear throughout the world during the last weeks of the COVID-19 global pandemic. God is on the move. We may never hear of all the ways he is encountering people as they are forced to a place of stillness, but we are learning of, uh, what we are learning of is confirmation that he remains on his throne and his love is more powerful than any virus. One incredible door has opened. Now listen to this part. Muslim-dominated country. Six secular TV stations will be broadcasting the Jesus film three times over the Easter season. And this, the person that wrote this goes on, he, the brother who told us this great news, it says, also shared, our local sister said this, with everyone being scared, stuck at home and watching TV, isn't this the best time to air the Jesus film on as many stations as possible? Amen. To provide some context, she says, we have never had this type of opportunity before in our country. Our Lord is indeed very powerfully at work in our midst. God is on the move 
And God, through the gospel, is at work in our midst. Don't miss what God is doing. Don't miss what God is saying to you. We pray for the unbelievers that that uh, do not know God yet, but that God would make himself known and they would respond to him in repentance and faith. We look for those opportunities to serve others during this time. Leverage the different means to communicate the gospel. Um, uh, we're, we're still collecting ping pong balls, guys, uh, and we're still praying that God give us more than 1,400 gospel conversations. And I've already heard stories about that, whether it's here in Meridian or whether it's halfway around the world. You guys are joining that that, that calls to continue to share the gospel. And so we want to keep doing that. We want to challenge uh, or we want to uh, invite our neighbors to join us online as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord next week. That would be an awesome way to reach out to your neighbor. Whatever it is, let us pray that God would bring a Holy Spirit-led revival to us personally first and then so that others, millions of others, would come to know him. Our world may be suffering, there may be anxiety, there absolutely may be fear, but King Jesus is in our midst, and he offers us real hope and real peace that he has himself secured by his blood that he has shed on the cross, and that we get to celebrate next week as he has risen from the grave, and that he is alive today. So some of you may be listening this morning and you're thinking, you know, I, I just don't have the kind of peace that, that you're talking about, but I want that kind of peace. Well, it's very simple. The Bible says that we have sin, and, and our sin separates us from God. And we have to acknowledge that. And, and, and we have to acknowledge that we deserve God's punishment for breaking God's rules and God's law. But th because God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die in our place, to die in your place. And so we... Uh, the, the, we, we believe that what Jesus did on the cross, it, it paid for our sin. And we also believe that he rose again three days later. And then commit yourself to following Jesus as your Lord. That means as the boss of your life. He's the one that gets to call the shots now. We follow what he says instead of what we want to do. And so if you want to do that this morning, if you've never come into that kind of, of peace-giving relationship this morning, Jesus is in the midst of you right now, and he is offering you the same peace offering that he offered Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. That if you would look to Jesus as your Savior and call on him, not only will you be saved, but you will be at peace no matter what comes. So if you want to do today, uh, do that today, then I want to encourage you to do that. And there's a way that you can, we can help you do that. And the number will be on the screen. But you can text uh, a prayer uh, to 601-340-9418. Uh, uh, that is 601 601- 340-9418, and I promise you, someone will get back with you and be able to help you and walk you through coming into this new relationship with Jesus. And, and as for our, uh, our, our church members and believers out there, what is God saying to you? What is God wanting to do with you in your life right now? And we, we want to look out into what God is doing and, what, and listen to what he is saying because there are millions of people around us that are all scared, all suffering, all in anxiety, and yet... The hope and the healing and the help and peace is found in Jesus. And so we can help give them that kind of antidote for their, their pain and their suffering right now. So whatever, however God wants to respond or you to respond, I pray that we would do that in faith and in and, and, and obedience. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for what you're about to do uh, for the sake of King Jesus and his glory and the good of your people. Lord, we love you, and we ask that you would continue to help us to respond to you in faith and in obedience. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.